evening. I'm Susan Moon, Executive Director of the Walnut Creek Library Foundation. And I'd like to welcome you to the first of our Finance 102 programs, Cybersecurity and Partnering with the FBI. I'd like to thank our Masterpiece sponsors, Kathy and Jerry Hicks, as well as our media and print sponsors, Diablo Magazine, East Bay Times, and Minuteman Press Lafayette. I'm pleased to welcome back tonight's presenter, Enrique Alvarez, a special agent in the cyber branch of the FBI's San Francisco field office. Enrique um, was a special agent at the FBI since 2002. At the FBI, he has supervised both counterintelligence and cyber national security squads. He is currently assigned to a multi-agency cyber task force at the Oakland Resident Agency. Prior to the FBI, he worked at various internet companies in San Francisco during the first dot-com boom, was a defense contractor in Los Angeles, and an adjunct instructor at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey. Enrique has also served as a U.S. Naval Reserve Intelligence Officer and retired in 2013 with the rank of commander. With the Navy, he served a combat duty tour of duty in Iraq between 2007 and 8. He graduated from Stanford University and has a master's degree from the Naval Postgraduate School. Tonight, he will provide an overview of cybersecurity, how the FBI investigates cybercrime, and describe best practices on how to protect yourself from becoming a victim. Following his presentation, we will have a brief Q&A and you can submit your questions in the Q&A box below the screen at any time. If you enjoyed tonight's program, please consider making a donation to the Library Foundation to support our program. Visit our website at wclibrary.org or click on the link located in the chat box to donate. Without further ado, please welcome Enrique Alvarez. Thank you, Susan, and welcome everyone. Uh, uh, thanks for uh, choosing to uh, spend some time uh, learning about cyber intrusion from the FBI. Uh, the FBI has been doing cyber outreach and, and uh, FBI San Francisco has been working on uh, this issue uh, for a number of years now. And what I'm gonna do tonight is talk to you about what we see in our casework and some of the techniques that we see malicious cyber actors using. So I'm gonna go ahead and start uh, the presentation now and let's if I can get a thumbs up from one of our hosts to make sure that you can see the slides. Um, Susan, are we able to see the slides? Okay, yes. Okay, I think we can see the slides here. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, as uh, Susan mentioned, my name is uh, Enrique Alvarez. I'm a special agent uh, with FBI uh, San Francisco's field office, and I work uh, I'm in the cyber branch and I'm currently working on a multi-agency um, at Cyber Intrusion. Tonight, I'm going to be working and talking about some of our um, sort of the techniques that we see in our casework, and therefore, the uh, traffic light protocol for tonight is AMBER. What that means for you as participants is uh, really, if you need to share the information that you hear tonight, please reach out to the uh, event sponsors or, uh, and have them contact me. This information is designed uh, for you tonight and for this event uh, specifically. Here's what I'll be talking about tonight. Uh, first, I'll talk a little bit about how cyber fits into the overall set of an FBI investigative priorities. And we'll get into a description of, of who we see uh, doing the hacking, uh, the techniques they use, how are they doing the hacking, and what type of information are these malicious cyber actors uh, after. And then I'll end with uh, kind of a discussion about how um, everyone here that's participating tonight uh, can partner with the FBI before a breach happens. Let's take a look at uh, first how cyber fits into the overall set uh, of FBI investigative priorities. Cyber division is actually the youngest division within the FBI's um, organizational structure. It was founded in 2002, about the time that I joined the FBI. 
Uh, there are other divisions and other priorities. And as of uh, this year, this is how uh, we prioritize our investigative um, assets. Terrorism can, continues to be the number one priority, followed by counterintelligence. This is our, our threat countries that are maybe spying on the United States and trying to steal uh, our secrets. Cybercrime in that short period of time has uh, jumped to the third highest level in our uh, priority uh, list of investigative um, uh, activities. Uh, we can see the rest of here, public corruption, civil rights, organized crime, white collar crime, and uh, violent crime and major thefts. We have 56 uh, field offices nationwide. San Francisco for everyone here tonight is your uh, closest field office. And we have at least one cyber squad at every field office. San Francisco is the fifth largest office and we have six cyber squads. Um, and uh, in addition to our domestic footprint, we have oh, 63, and, and I put a plus there because that number uh, increases uh, over time, FBI legal attaches worldwide. And these are senior FBI agents that sit um, in embassies uh, in, in countries around the world. And a lot of those embassies have uh, cyber-focused assistant legal attaches who assist with our overseas investigations and they also help that country's um, national police force if they have uh, cyber investigations that touch the United States and they need assistance from us. Let's look at cybersecurity responsibilities across the FBI. Sometimes there's a lot of confusion about who in the US government uh, actually is tasked to investigate cyber intrusion. Um, we have some important partners starting up at the at top tier. We have the Department of Homeland Security. Um, this includes uh, Homeland Security Investigations and uh, CISA, the Cyber Infrastructure um, Agency. Uh, CISA came really into prominence um, during the last election. And you can think of CISA as a very prescriptive uh, agency. They're looking out to make uh, all American businesses and people uh, much harder targets. Uh, to keep them safe uh, from cyber intrusion. We also partner, uh, in addition with HSI, we partner with our, our uh, longtime colleagues in the Secret Service. Uh, they also investigate a number of financially motivated crime. We partner, of course, with DOD um, and the National Security Agency and the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, those types of agencies have a foreign uh, focus. Uh, they are looking at investigations and issues that are outside the United States. And then we have the Department of Justice, the FBI is subordinate to DOJ. Um, but the, really, the, the real takeaway here is that the FBI is the lead US domestic investigative agency for cyber intrusion. So if there's a cyber intrusion, call us, contact us. We have uh, the most uh, largest number of uh, special agents and intelligence analysts who are focused on cyber crime and cyber issues. Uh, we have uh, we bring a lot of people to that to that fight, and uh, and we have, as I mentioned before, we have 56 field offices, so we have personnel that are near pretty much any kind of cyber investigation that exists domestically. All right, so let's take a look at who's doing the hacking. Uh, broadly, we look at uh, cyber actors along a spectrum, going from left to right, sort of least capable over to on the right hand side, the most capable. If you remember from maybe the mid 2010s, maybe 2008, 2009, we saw the real rise of hacktivism. Uh, there were groups uh, like Anonymous and Lulsec. Uh, that really kind of raise, uh, rose to prominence in the news uh, by conducting hacking operations that are typically very socially motivated. Um, they look at companies and uh, uh, government actors, uh, including the FBI, that they don't like, uh, and they will typically leverage the power of a community to conduct uh, offensive cyber operations. Um, Hacktivists also like to dox people. Doxing is the practice of uh, finding out information on a particular person, uh, finding out where they live, um, their uh, personally identifiable information, where they live, uh, addresses, things like that, and then dumping that onto the um, internet. We saw some hacktivist groups doing that in 2009, 2010. Cybercrime, of course, we spend a, a lot of resources within the FBI investigating cybercrime, and, and by far that's a, an enormous chunk of work. 
I do want to mention insider threat. I won't spend a lot of time talking about that tonight, but the, the, con the concept of insider threat is that you are typically focused on uh, threats that are external to your organization or to your business. Uh, but sometimes you have people inside your organization that may become uh, um, upset with the organization or they may have uh, a grudge. And typically these insider uh, actors uh, already have privileged access to your information, to your network. And if they go bad, uh, it's typically much harder initially to discover their activities. Espionage, uh, we look at cyber from both a cyber criminal aspect and from a nation state uh, conducted aspect, uh, we have threat countries like Russia and China, North Korea, uh, that are conducting very aggressive uh, cyber intrusion campaigns, trying to steal uh, valuable secrets from both the US government and also from US industry so that they can take that valuable intellectual property and copy it and uh, bring their countries uh, either up to speed or try in a way to uh, exceed what we're doing here in, in the United States. We do worry about cyber terrorism. Thankfully, uh, we have not seen a lot uh, of this. Um, you, you are, you're all familiar with uh, terrorist activity, but we worry to see about how terrorist groups can uh, organize and utilize cyber tools and cyber attacks to further their causes. And then finally, uh, we worry about cyber war. Uh, where a full-blown nation state's uh, full effort uh, could be applied uh, to a devastating, potentially devastating cyber attack in the United States. And, and we try to explain that. Uh, we think about attacks on our power grid, turning off the power for large portions of the country, um, tainting water supplies, things like that. Uh, we worry a lot about that. And we uh, sort of track capabilities of our um, of the threat actors that we look at and we uh, communicate uh, those techniques that we see and, and vulnerabilities that are discovered uh, to power companies and water companies and things like that so that they can uh, remain abreast of, of uh, all the latest threats. So how are they doing it? Um, if you remember two things from tonight, remember credential theft and phishing and spear phishing. These are the techniques that are uh, quite, uh, they're actually quite simple to do, but um, we see them over and over again uh, in our casework. Um, the reason we see them over and over again is that they tend to work. Um, people uh, have a lot of uh, credentials that have been stolen. People have a tendency not to change their passwords over time. So if your credentials are stolen, they can be aggregated onto these very large lists that get so, uh, sold on the dark web or traded amongst uh, criminal groups. And you'd be surprised at how uh, many large scale intrusions begin um, with just being able to use stolen credentials. Phishing and spear phishing, hopefully by this point in time, you've heard uh, and understand what these terms mean. Phishing is just the technique of just sending a large amount of email out to a large number of uh, validated email addresses and hoping to get one of those people to click on your malicious enclosure or go to a malicious website or turn over uh, information, uh, personally identifiable information, which can be used then uh, to commit some crimes. So how can you counter that? Credential theft, um, multi-factor authentication, MFA, you may have heard of this. Uh, you may have also heard it uh, referred to as two-factor authentication. Uh, thankfully, a lot of banks and uh, healthcare providers and even your email providers, if you're with Google or uh, Microsoft, uh, offer these as options. Uh, my advice, uh, based on what we've seen in our casework, is if you have a choice to enable MFA on an account that you have, do so. Um, the reason is that it makes it harder for a cyber criminal who may already have your username and password uh, to take over your account. Because with multi-factor authentication, uh, an additional factor is sent out maybe typically to your phone in the form of a, uh, an SMS message with a unique code. If you have, if you have possession of your phone, the, if the criminals don't, then they will not be able to take over that account. Um, criminals are always uh, trying to figure out how to defeat this, and there are ways to defeat MFA, but it, as I said, it makes it harder, and you just don't want to be an easy target. Phishing and spear phishing, if you're with a company, um, you're working from home during the pandemic, um, just learn to 
understand and recognize what a typical phishing or spear phishing email might look like. Spear phishing uh, is, is a highly targeted version of phishing. It may go to a very small select group of employees, maybe within the same department, or maybe with the um, executive uh, management of a company. Um, the idea there is that you want to look for emails that may not sound the same uh, as you're normally hearing. Maybe the English isn't as good. And um, again, if you have multi-factor authentication enabled by default, uh, that phishing and spear phishing attacks uh, aren't uh, nearly as successful. Some other things we see, ransomware, um, you've probably all heard about this uh, in the, during the pandemic, we really saw a, a giant spike in ransomware attacks, very devastating ransomware attacks. This is where a malicious cyber actor is able to penetrate and attack uh, a company or an enterprise and encrypt all of the computers um, on that network. Ransomware uh, utilizes a number of techniques um, that allow the ransomware to travel uh, in within an enterprise uh, from machine to machine. So, uh, and, and it moves very, very quickly. Uh, once those machines are encrypted, uh, the user is unable to access any information on those computers. And the attackers then are essentially holding that company's vital information uh, for ransom. And typically there is a, a ransom to be paid. The actors communicate with the victim. And, um, and then unless the victim has a good uh, offline backup or endpoint protection or training, uh, that victim is forced uh, to pay that ransom to get their data back. Uh, ransomware is almost always initiated by a victim clicking on a malicious link or installing an app or enabling macros in a Microsoft uh, uh, Office document. Uh, it takes action typically by the victim to initiate uh, that actual ransomware attack. So again, employee training is uh, very key. Understand what, what might look suspicious. If it's suspicious, be able to report it in a safe and sane way. Uh, if you uh, have a good offline backup capability, and by offline, I mean not connected to your enterprise, because again, most ransomware attacks now are network aware. So if they see uh, additional servers that are available, one of those servers might be your backup server, they will encrypt the backup. So being able to backup your enterprise and then move those backups off of, a, off of that network so that uh, they will be immune to a ransomware attack. If you have something like that, uh, then you won't have to pay the ransom. And finally, endpoint security, actual uh, software and hardware that uh, is looking at each endpoint. An endpoint is a laptop or a desktop computer or a mobile device in your enterprise. Uh, if you have good endpoint protection, you can usually typically stop an attack uh, before it happens. Other techniques we see, password spray attacks. That's where a malicious actor has a whole list of, of known passwords that are out there. Those Passwords number in the billions now, and it's very easy to access libraries and, and databases of, of passwords that have been observed and cracked uh, from other victims. And then they just continue to apply those password spray attacks on accounts. Uh, insecure systems, it's very hard to keep, especially if you're a very large enterprise, keeping everything patched. It, I understand that it's hard and it's difficult, but it's at, the larger the, your enterprise is, the more vital it is to patch things. Um, a lot of cases that we see in the FBI begin with um, a known vulnerability that is scanned by a, a number of set of, of malicious actors. They just find a machine that has not been patched and then they apply that attack uh, and then they're in. So um, in many cases, the vulnerabilities are reported, they're patched by the vendors, but we see victims not uh, patching uh, and not uh, fixing that problem. And so then those systems remain vulnerable to, again, very talented and dedicated uh, criminal actors who uh, are able to scan uh, at length uh, whole swatches of the, of the internet to find machines that uh, are vulnerable. Other things we see, social engineering. Uh, this is where someone can uh, convince a victim to do something either through uh, email through a chat, we've seen it done through chat uh, applications like Discord and iMessage and, and uh, Android uh, messaging, and, but also telephone stuff, being able to call up and identify key employees in, in a company um, and being able to identify victims through social engineering. I, I think this is the most interesting, one of the most interesting techniques that we've seen. We saw a lot of it 
during the pandemic as well uh, through voice phishing attacks, what we call phishing. Uh, so be aware of, of, you know, and train your employees and, and make them aware that, you know, someone calling out of the blue, asking a lot of questions, uh, they may say they are a consultant that's been hired by the company, or they may be with the phone company, or they may be with whatever. But we've seen some very creative uh, methods used to elicit information from victims uh, in sort of a pre-attack mode by those malicious actors. Other things we see, DDoS, distributed denial of service attacks, SQL injections. This is a attack that goes back to the very earliest days of the internet uh, involving uh, anytime you see a username and password input field on a web uh, on a web page, if those things are not uh, set up correctly with the associated database that it checks, it's easy to break that and then break into the database, um, a well-formed uh, login procedure um, uh, that you develop should be immune to that. But again, we see uh, SQL injection attacks, which again are a very old attack. Uh, we see that happening all the time. Uh, typically later on, as an intruder gets deeper into your network, we'll see them drop what are called web shells. These are kind of HTML pages that allow them, allow those uh, malicious actors to kind of automate their attacks, tool drops, things like that. And then of course, data exfiltration. So again, looking at the ways that you can prevent these sort of things from happening include, you know, very dedicated network monitoring. Uh, if you're a small organization, um, uh, I get it, it's hard to do that. But there are ways you can offload that uh, to other companies that can do that for you. Uh, and if you see uh, malicious activity, they, they can help you stop that before it uh, starts. Let's talk about the compromised chain. Think of it as a story uh, moving from left to right where a malicious set of actors might conduct reconnaissance on your network. And uh, to do that, they're gonna try to figure out who to attack and think about your company or your own personal uh, social media accounts. Most companies have Twitter accounts. Those, Twitter, um, those tweets will have identify activity that company is involved with, or they may even name um, actual uh, employees that are doing things. And that would give those malicious actors names to attack. Uh, they'll look at YouTube channels that your company publishes. Um, you may have uh, interviews of some of your employees. They may describe uh, the sort of things that they do. Uh, Facebook posts and definitely LinkedIn. If you're um, if you have a publicly facing LinkedIn profile, and, and I do, because uh, I do a lot of outreach, um, be careful about describing in too much detail what you do, because again, uh, that's for everyone to see, and you could be identified as someone either to attack. If you say, I'm a network administrator for uh, for Apple or something like that, well, that's going to make you an interesting target because some of those malicious actors will know based on your job description that you might have elevated privileges and you might be a good person to attack. If you can pop uh, that person's uh, devices, then you're going to enjoy the same privileges that they do. So that initial compromise will be probably delivered, as I mentioned, through email or other types of attacks, like those SQL injection attacks that I talked about in the previous slide. But again, phishing, spear phishing through email is uh, kind of a, a go-to uh, technique that we see, again, being utilized over and over again. It, the attacker has to be right once. If they send out a phishing attack to 50 people and one person clicks on it, they win. Uh, the company that's defending against that they have to be right all the time. And so as you can see, the odds are, are often in the attacker's favor. So when somebody clicks on that malicious link, the, the malicious actors will establish a foothold uh, in that network. Uh, they're going to see what that particular device, what that particular user, uh, what kind of privileges they might uh, be able to enjoy and, and use with uh, based on their role in the company. But from there, they're going to try to escalate privileges. And the idea there is they're going to Using the information that they see within that targeted enterprise, they may be able to identify uh, encrypted passwords for, say, system administrators. Well, then they can use a number of off-the-shelf tools to try to brute force and attack those uh, encrypted um, passwords. And if someone is not using a really good password, well, you can crack them in relatively short order. So if they're able to do that, they might then uh, assume the uh, uh, identity of, say, a system administrator. They'll do internal reconnaissance within that company. They're going to be looking and moving laterally from whatever initial device they got onto. Maybe it was a tablet, maybe it was a laptop, maybe it was a desktop, but then trying to move laterally into the company's servers, looking for that valuable information that they want. 
they're going to expand their presence. Uh, if they have one admin account, maybe they'll create five more and not use them. Maybe they'll create other types of uh, drop tools or uh, expand their presence in a way that if some of the operational accounts that they're using get uh, discovered, they can just move on to another one. That's why it's so hard to eradicate uh, malicious actors from a targeted enterprise. The longer that they're there, the more entrenched they become. After they've, after they've identified whatever it is they want to steal, let's say this is valuable intellectual property or financial data or what have you, those malicious actors will kind of package it up They'll store it on a server uh, within the company, but then they will begin to exfiltrate. And exfiltrate means they're going to send that data away from that targeted enterprise uh, over to repositories. It could be Dropbox, Google Drive. Uh, it could be custom servers that they set up to do this. And that's where they're gonna take and steal that information. And typically we see more uh, sophisticated actors kind of monitoring and understanding what that targeted enterprise's uh, network traffic looks like. And they're going to try to disguise that data exfiltration uh, to look like normal traffic um, within uh, that company. I can tell you that a lot of victims that report and um, come to the FBI and say, hey, we think we've been uh, attacked or we think we ha have been compromised. Uh, the first time they notice that they've been attacked or that they've been compromised is when they see data leading their enterprise. And as you can see in this, in this diagram, that's kind of the last, next to last step, right? So that means that the malicious actors have been in that enterprise for a long time. And then lastly, those actors will try to maintain presence. They know that by the time that they begin to exfiltrate data, that's the noisiest part of that intrusion. Up till this point, they've been very careful. They've been very quiet. But again, moving data off in volume is very noisy. And typically, that's when those attacks are, are noticed by the victim. Some of the things we've seen uh, as criminal uh, uh, organizations have evolved, uh, we, we see something almost we would kind of refer to internally as intrusion as a service, right? We, and, and that means you see these uh, large criminal enterprise uh, uh, organizations. You can think of them almost as companies. Um, they're highly organized. Uh, they recruit uh, talented uh, technical talent, uh, software engineers, database engineers, uh, vulnerability researchers. Um, they uh, operate uh, practically in virtual anonymity. Most of, the, most of the actors that are in these large groups uh, have never met in real life. Uh, they may not even know who they are in real life. They may just know them as a hacker monitor. Uh, they operate extensively on the Tor network. That's the onion router. That's the dark web you may have heard about. Uh, that's just a way of uh, using misattributable series of servers to connect and, and uh, conduct business so that your actual machine with your actual IP address is masked and very hard to get to. They conduct essentially what are business operations, but essentially they are uh, highly organized criminals. Uh, they typically trade, uh, collect ransomware data, collect payments from their victims using cryptocurrency, which is an anonymous form of currency, which is very hard uh, to trace. You've probably heard of Bitcoin. That's one of the most popular uh, cryptocurrencies. Centers of activity, typically Eastern Europe, uh, some in Asia, uh, Africa, of course, Nigeria, you've heard of all of the scams that exist in Nigeria, uh, some in the US, but not much. But uh, typically Eastern Europe is where we see these um, uh, virtual uh, criminal enterprise companies existing. This is a, a wanted poster for Yevgeny Mikhailovich Bogachev. Uh, he is an old school hacker dating back uh, a number of years, maybe 15, 20 years. Uh, he's the author of the Zeus uh, Bank Trojan, uh, which uh, was used to attack banks in Russia and in Europe and in the United States in three different ways. Uh, he's a very wealthy man, lives, uh, he's retired, lives in the, on a DACA in the, uh, in the Black Sea. He's a friend of uh, Vladimir Putin. We have a $4 million US bounty on him. And for a long time, he was the highest cyber criminal uh, bounty that we had. 2020, though, he was eclipsed uh, by uh, uh, Maxim Viktorovich Yakubets. He is the head of the notorious uh, Evil Corp gang. Sometimes they're also referred to as the Revil group because they got involved in ransomware. Uh, you can see some photos of him here. I want to point out the, uh, the photo on the right, the, the, the uh, thumbnail on the right. That was taken at his wedding in Moscow. It was a massive uh, affair, all paid for by ill-gotten gains from uh, his computer gang. 
Speaking of ransomware, uh, let's talk about that. That is one of the uh, largest um, uh, spikes that we have seen in the last couple of years. Um, this animated GIF kind of shows you uh, what a typical victim might see in a ransomware attack. They show up at their computer, they unlock it, and they see the, a note from the attacker saying, hey, all of your data has been encrypted. There's a ransomware amount that they want you to pay. There's typically a clock uh, that will show how much time you have to pay. Uh, it'll give instructions about how to pay that ransom. Typically that is within, uh, done with cryptocurrency, uh, typically Bitcoin. Um, it is by far in a way, the most profitable type of cybercrime that we track uh, within the FBI. Um, what we find over and over again is that cyber ransomware victims typically do not have uh, a good backup strategy so that their ransom, uh, sorry, that their, their information typically is unavailable. And they, if they're a company, they simply cannot conduct business. If they're a public sector component, like a, a police department, a library, uh, hospitals, um, these are all victims of ransomware. Uh, it is sometimes cheaper just to pay the ransom to get their, uh, their data back. 2020 uh, reported losses were just uh, over $11 billion. That's a billion with a B. Uh, 2021 losses, uh, the estimate, we're not done with the year yet, is uh, about 20 billion. We think actually it's going to be more than that because not all ransomware victims uh, may, would report that they've actually been attacked. Uh, sometimes it's an embarrassment uh, issue. They don't like to report that. So sometimes the USG, we don't get uh, all of that data. Um, Sometimes we see uh, ransomware actors uh, using an affiliate model. In other words, ransomware as a service. So you may remember the ransomware, the, the highly publicized ransomware attack on the Colonial Pipeline uh, in the East Coast of the United States, which kind of crippled uh, gas uh, fuel transfer operations. That was done by um, a ransomware group called Darkside. It was actually investigated by uh, FBI San Francisco. And, um, and uh, the, um, the actual uh, ransomware group that owned the technology had licensed it to, uh, to Darkside and to another group, a set of criminals uh, that just licensed that capability to make some money. So it, it, we see it actually evolving as quite a bit of um, uh, sort of sharing, if you will, of the technology. So in, in extortion, obviously ransomware is an extortion attack, right? These, these uh, actors will, um, will make that attack and then they're extorting you to get your data back. So you have to pay the ransom. We've seen the model evolve uh, over the last year where um, we'll actually see a double extortion. Uh, so the ransomware guys may say, well, you can have your data back, but we've also copied some of your most sensitive company information. So six months later, they may come back and say, well, give us another payment. Uh, otherwise we're going to release uh, all of your uh, competitive data or your intellectual property uh, so they can continue on uh, being able to extort money from those victims. And in some cases we've seen what's called a triple extortion where um, the ransomware actors may give the data back, but they maintain persistence. Remember that uh, sort of um, compromise chain slide I had earlier. They maintain access to that victim network and then they can conduct a DOS, uh, a denial of service attack. And again, they'll stop that attack if you pay uh, an additional ransom. We've seen in some uh, situations at what we call double encryption. That's a side-by-side, -side, uh, different, two different types of um, encryption uh, uh, algorithms or layered encryption. Uh, you may pay one ransom to get halfway there and then another ransom to get all the way, uh, all of your data back. But oddly, uh, this whole uh, ransomware model is built on trust. And I know that sounds kind of odd to say, but the whole idea is that the ransomware actors know that if they don't actually give the data back, uh, it actually decreases the chances that a victim will pay. So they try to make it e easy on the victims. In fact, some ransomware groups call their victims customers, ironically. Uh, they'll, the, the ransomware um, actors will set up call centers. They'll actually rent call centers uh, in India and pay people to answer questions, answer the phone, answer questions about uh, how they can pay, how to obtain cryptocurrency, how to transfer that. And when, they, when the victims typically pay, um, our data show that typically those ransomware actors will give that, um, 
that data back to the victims. Uh, again, again, it has to base, be based on a trust model. People be, want to be, have to be willing to pay the ransom. Uh, otherwise, people just technically won't, won't do that. Mitigation, as, as I mentioned in the earlier part of the presentation, offline backups are key. Uh, if you have backups and they're connected to the same network that the ransomware guys are attacking, uh, they will typically uh, encrypt your backups. So again, uh, think about ways to um, take your, value, your most valuable data and, and take it offline. Uh, a lot of uh, companies have now purchased uh, cyber insurance for ransomware. Uh, it's a whole uh, area of insurance that didn't really exist about four years ago, but we see many, many major um, business insurance um, policies now offer a cyber insurance policy that will help protect um, against ransomware attacks. And on average, um, from a recent ransomware task force that was called um, by the White House, by the US government uh, in 2020, uh, most victims are reporting about 287 days to recover. So you can see it's a very impactful attack uh, and a lot of time is lost uh, if, you hit, if you get hit with ransomware. Uh, I want to talk real briefly about what we call business email compromise. This is not technically a cyber attack, although it uses kind of a spoofed email, that, an example of which um, you see here. Um, this is an email that is, that is not legitimate, it, although it looks like it may have come from somebody in your company. And this one here looks like it's coming from the CEO of a company. It's being sent to the CFO. And the message is, hey, I just uh, inked a deal and we need to send $250,000 uh, you know, to this, uh, this, this uh, wire transfer address, we need to do it today, make it happen. And so this kind of preys upon an employee's uh, willingness to want to try to do the right thing and, and be responsive to a task from someone that they think is the CEO or someone from the C-suite. Um, so we see, you know, the scam is targeting businesses. Um, typically, they might have foreign suppliers um, in China or other places, uh, businesses that regularly perform wire transfer payments as part of buying or uh, acquiring uh, raw material to make other types of, of um, products. Um, suppliers and the customers can be victims of the scam. Again, the targets typically are uh, the members of the uh, C-suite uh, within a company or their executive assistants. How do you think the uh, most actors identify those executive assistants? Going back to that reconnaissance phase, right? They're looking at LinkedIn, they're looking at uh, Facebook, they're looking at Twitter, and they're trying to identify who these people are. And again, this is really a social engineering attack. They're trying to convince somebody to do something um, where they may not normally do that by adding, uh, you know, demands. This is a short notice, a short notice request. We just think this deal, it's got to be done by tonight, or else the deal will fall through. So again, they're preying upon uh, an employee's uh, response uh, to what they think is a legitimate, might be a legitimate request. Uh, we used to call this man in the middle email, but we kind of renamed it to business email compromise uh, to show that it really attacks um, typically are, are suffered by companies. Uh, let's talk about the financial fraud kill chain. Um, there is a great uh, service that's provided by the government called um, uh, the Internet Crime Complaint Center. IC3.gov is the uh, URL. Um, if your company is hit with one of these BEC wire transfer frauds, um, you can go to that website and report it. And viable complaints are forwarded to a, a, for triage via a team uh, at FBI headquarters uh, through an automated system. There are folks on duty 24-7. Um, they can't respond to every single um, attack, but um, the ones that they do are, or are able to respond to, uh, they're able to actually employ what we call a recovery asset team to streamline communications with um, the financial institutions that are involved. If, if, the, if the funds were transferred to say a domestic uh, institution, a, a bank of some kind, the uh, IC3 team has already points of contacts at most uh, U.S. financial institutions, and in some cases, they're able to either freeze uh, those funds before they can be siphoned off uh, to other accounts. If the money went overseas, um, we work with our partners um, at FinCEN, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, uh, operated by the Department of Treasury, to try and uh, uh, talk to those uh, international institutions and be able to sort of maybe either freeze or claw back uh, all or some of those funds. 
Uh, tax during the pandemic, uh, you know, I thought we'd be done uh, with that, but uh, as you can see, some of us are still working from home. Uh, during 2020, uh, at the height of uh, folk, prior to the uh, fielding of the um, actual uh, uh, vaccines, uh, when most people were working from home, we saw a, a large spike in what we call RDP attacks, remote desktop protocols. Again, folks were connecting from home on machines that typically weren't managed by those companies. Uh, so there, there's a vast array of different types of, of vulnerabilities that may have resided on those endpoints. Um, the cyber criminals knew that, and they were looking at RDP attacks as a way to uh, gain privileges to get use, you know, attack that endpoint and then move into a targeted network. Again, the RDP attacks actually just really relied on password cracking, and they were counting on folks having uh, simple passwords. And so those simple passwords, if you're able to get into that, they typically can, can uh, brute force uh, those weak passwords and then, and then boom, they're, uh, they're actually logged in as those uh, employees. It's a huge challenge to the kind of the bring your own device nature of the at-home workforce, which I think we can all agree is kind of fundamentally changed how uh, all of us work. Uh, I'm giving this presentation from home. Uh, most people uh, are actually still at home working, so it, this, this this problem really has uh, has not gone away. Uh, going back to ransomware attacks again, ransomware attacks can be initiated by somebody working at home if they're connected and have a privileged sort of access to their company's enterprise. If they click on that link uh, using their home laptop, that giant ransomware attack will begin, and and you utilize the connection, that privileged connection between that that person and their company to conduct that uh, devastating attack. Uh, the, the top sectors that we saw in 2020, healthcare, state and local government, uh, industrial, IoT, uh, these were sectors that uh, cyber criminals uh, typically attacked uh, and tried to get access to during the pandemic. Uh, do a quick case study uh, from the Twitter hack uh, from the summer of 2020. Uh, this is uh, Graham Clark. At the time, he was 17 years old. Um, he found uh, an internal Twitter employee's credentials, username and password uh, on a Slack channel. Slack is a kind of a way to collaborate uh, with your coworkers remotely. It's very popular uh, with a lot of companies. And so this, this guy, Graham Clark, was uh, sitting around on a Twitter Slack channel and found a set of credentials. Well, he tried logging in in March of 2020, but found that it was protected by 2FA, multi-factor authentication. So he sat on those uh, credentials for a while. And then in the summer, oh, there's, there's Mr. Clark right there. Uh, in the summer, he vished a Twitter employee. Remember I said what vishing is using a phone. So he called that Twitter employee who was working from home in July. And he claimed to be Twitter IT support and said, hey, I need to do a test of your multi-factor authentication. Can you please read me the token? Uh, try logging in right now and read me the token just to make sure that it works. And of course, the a Twitter employee was was fooled by this vishing attack and read Mr. Clark his um, uh, his token and then uh, Mr. Clark was able to log in as that employee. Turns out that employee had very elevated privileges and he obtained remote access to. Uh, I'm not joking. It's called God Mode uh, internal tool. That's the Twitter's internal description for it, which is capable of making any change to any account. And so you can think that's. Pretty, pretty severe. The only account that had any further protection was the president's account at the time that had some additional levels of protection on it. But you saw that this, uh, this actor then uh, attempted, conspired with two other people that he knew to sell access to these Twitter accounts uh, using Bitcoin. So we're lucky that it was a 17 year old kid from Florida who did this and not uh, say a Lieutenant Colonel from the Russian GRU. Uh, he was ultimately uh, found guilty and sentenced to three, three years in jail and three years of probation. Here's another uh, quick uh, case study of a state-sponsored intrusion. This is a picture um, of the um, uh, a Chinese aircraft. Um, it it uh, was designed to um, sort of be a, a clone of the uh, Boeing 737. It was gonna be designed and produced in China. Uh, the company that, the Chinese company that, that produces is called Comac. And they made a lot of deals with subcontractors that you can see in this graphic. Um, you know, companies from Germany, um, in England, but a lot of them obviously in the United States, some in France as well, to build different parts of the aircraft. Well, what these partners didn't realize is that um, while this deal was inked, the 
the Chinese government, particularly the Ministry of State Security, tasked uh, a subordinate unit to carry out simultaneous cyber attacks on those same subcontractors. Uh, it was a coordinated multi-year campaign. Uh, they leveraged even some insider threat actors within some of these companies. And they systematically went after all of that valuable uh, intellectual property um, that they were selling to Comac uh, to make this aircraft, the C-919. Uh, to help that hacking effort, the Chinese government recruited from actual Chinese underground hackers uh, who they kind of look the other way if they help out the government. They developed some really, really interesting malware uh, custom tools uh, referred to um, by industry, by Sakula, PlugX, and, and Winti um, to conduct this campaign. Uh, and they got access to a lot of these um, subcontractors and stole that information. Uh, there is a slight silver lining to this. Um, as a result of this hacking campaign, um, the FBI and some external partners um, conducted this investigation. We identified some of the Chinese government actors, and we were able to actually arrest um, a couple of actors uh, who were in Europe at the time. And because they, uh, we had red notice and we had a reciprocity with those uh, countries, Belgium and Germany, I believe, we were able to get at least two of them uh, back to the United States. Uh, lastly, to talk about cyber war, um, what it might look like. Um, back in 2015, three uh, Ukrainian power companies uh, suffered simultaneous devastating cyber attacks resulted in power outages affecting uh, almost a quarter, uh, almost half a million people. Uh, it's very cold in December in the Ukraine, and so uh, turning off the power is actually uh, a pretty serious attack. They, it was a very sophisticated attack using uh, attacking SCADA control systems. Uh, these are systems that control hardware uh, in, involved in the transmission uh, of electricity, but it started with stolen uh, virtual private network credentials, right? Again, back to credential theft, and from there, they were able to uh, infiltrate uh, and, and infect a lot of uh, different endpoints, which allowed them to conduct this um, attack. While the attack occurred, not only did they uh, deny access to the power companies, but they actually did firmware overwrites on actual physical equipment, which essentially made them useless. And then they did a simultaneous telephone denial of service attack, a TDOS attack, so that the customers and the operators could not communicate with each other. The last stage of the attack involved kill disk malware, which basically wiped the controller workstations uh, after the attack began. And then the next year, they, the, uh, the, the attackers did it again. And, and we assess with high uh, degree of confidence that this was a Russian government uh, attack on Ukraine. So before the breach, um, uh, I'd like to uh, show this example here. This was a tweet. Uh, that happened in 2020, someone talking about safety lasagna. If you think about one aspect of the pandemic, you wanna think about not only just masks, but you wanna combine masks with social distancing and then getting a COVID test and hand washing. No one thing is a magic bullet. You have to sort of combine these all these things together. And this person, Lizzie O'Leary, referred to it as safety lasagna. Uh, Nicole Perloth, who's a very uh, prominent cybersecurity um, author and journalist said, uh, uh, she wanted to replace defense in depth with safety lasagna, and that kind of caught on. Uh, but again, those of us who worry about uh, computer intrusion for a living um, uh, kind of got a kick out of those uh, out of those terms. So again, before the breach, contact uh, your local FBI cyber squad. If you're here in San Francisco, um, your you uh, the uh, organizers of this event know how to get in touch with me. Uh, the idea there is you want to try and establish. Uh, a working relationship with us. And, and that working relationship can, can be anything that you want. It can be a yearly check-in, it can be a monthly check-in, it can be sharing data that you see. Um, again, sharing data uh, really is, a, is a, a conversation that has to happen with your own legal folks, but the more data you can share, the better we think we can, we can help you protect yourself because we can compare it to what we have in our indices and, and then sort of help you become a harder target. But as uh, a future victim, you want to sort of develop and more importantly, test uh, a cyber incident response plan and be able to discuss and share suspicious network activity with the FBI. And again, if you see things, uh, you know, go ahead and report that to IC3.gov. During the breach, um, you know, those are the kind of the, the, the typical steps uh, involved in any good cyber incident response plan. You're going to, you're going to want to activate it, but give us a call. 
point, you already have a POC, a point of contact. Uh, you've spoken maybe with a cyber supervisor or a cyber agent like myself and be able to sort of say, it's happening, here's what's going on. And again, if you have a, a third party forensics partner, if that's part of your plan, uh, you know, companies like Mandiant that, that help greatly can assist the investigative aspect of understanding how that um, uh, actual intrusion occurred. Uh, the FBI can keep a low profile if you help, if you bring us in uh, early on while things are happening. We're not going to show up in a raid van wearing uh, tactical gear. We'll show up in flannel shirts and backpacks. Uh, our priority, uh, especially in the nascent stages of an of a actual cyber attack, is to really try to figure out and develop actor attribution. We want to analyze digital evidence. If you are collecting digital evidence as part of your cyber incident response plan, uh, if you can share that with us, it greatly assists our ability to conduct investigations. And we even have optional active measures that we can employ if we've talked about it ahead of time with your legal um, groups, uh, legal representatives uh, versus the actors, because they're, the actors are likely still going to be in your enterprise. But again, our goal is to get the bad guys. InfraGuard is a, uh, a great partnership that we have between the private sector and the U.S. Uh, and, and the FBI has lead in that, in that organization. We have uh, local uh, chapters and uh, four times a year, we exchange information with InfraGuard members. Um, you can get to meet and talk with FBI agents, uh, talk about all the different types of things that we investigate, cyber included. Uh, we have a Bay Area uh, chapter and you can just go to infraguard.org to find information about that. And that's the San Francisco chapter uh, address uh, for our local uh, InfraGuard. Okay, that's the end of the presentation. Um, this is a, um, a ransomware um, screen that people who were attacked by the WannaCry uh, family of ransomware. Um, initially, it was kind of puzzling because the uh, people who paid the ransom uh, never got their data back. We now know uh, that this was, in fact, a North Korean uh, uh, play, um, either testing their capability to conduct cyber warfare or just get some badly needed uh, hard currency. So uh, I'll turn it now back over to Susan and uh, I'm gonna stop my presentation and, and maybe we can address your, uh, your questions. Okay, thank you Enrique. Um, we have lots of questions and... Uh, <laughs> So I will go ahead um, and, and start with the first one. Um, and I think this, this question was pertaining to that first, uh, the first slide that you were showing. Um, mm -hmm. Why wasn't the CIA in the list of agencies looking out for overseas intelligence? Well, the CIA is one of those agencies we do work with, um, and uh, it's weird. They, they're very sensitive about having their name on, on slides. So, um, but yeah, the CIA is a partner of ours, an important partner. They have a, a really important cyber mission. Uh, they are looking at it, of course, from the nation state standpoint and how um, threat nations are utilizing cyber activities uh, to try to attack us. So if they are um, seeing that information, we are sharing that, they're sharing that information with us. And then if we're able to address that as a team, we, we definitely do uh, work with them. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. With so many revelations of corporate hacking of customer data, an increasing mountain of phishing attempts by home and work emails, phone, and text, do you think that the bad guys have the personal info of most of the individuals in the country? And if so, how can we as individuals close the barn door after the horse has bolted? Yeah, that's a that's a good question and a good visual on that question. So I think we are we are approaching almost a post privacy phase of existence. Right uh, back in the day, you could kind of keep your PII protected. Um, however, there is an enormous amount of information on all of us that are, that is collected with consent uh, by our credit card companies by our mortgage companies, uh, by our, our, the cities that we live in when we pay taxes. So unfortunately, a lot of those people that aggregate and collect that data have suffered breaches, right? So we're living in, in a world where there's breach, data breach after data breach after data breach. So in many ways, um, none of us enjoy that, uh, having our PII protected uh, as we used to. So how do you 
uh, then protect yourself if you assume that all of your private uh, data is out there. Well, you can take those, some of those steps that we talked about in the presentation about um, you know, putting locks on your credit report, for example, um, this, so that uh, anytime someone tries to make a credit check, uh, there's a restriction on that. That would, that would prevent somebody from, say, taking out a loan on your behalf uh, that you would be stuck with the bill. Um, personal health information, right? Again, uh, we saw the Anthem attack, uh, which we now know was a, was a state-sponsored attack by China. Um, again, all of that uh, health data is now sort of potentially compromised. So the idea there is you wanna put um, measures into place that frustrate the efforts for people to take advantage of that information. Again, so freezes on your credit report, um, putting a pin on your cell phone company's uh, account, right? So that uh, another person just can't call and maybe hijack your phone. There has the pin number that you have recorded that is not published anywhere uh, that would prevent someone from taking over your phone. Because remember, our phones now are, are acting as kind of a digital wallet. So if somebody were to actually clone and take control of your phone, they could get access to all of your accounts. But even if you have two-factor authentication enabled, the bank or the insurance company or the health uh, insurance company is going to send that uh, token to your phone. And if your phone is compromised, think about how hard it would be to get back into your accounts. So again, just take those steps to make it harder. Assume that that information is out there, just make it harder for those actors to utilize it. Um, Enrique, my, I'm having technical difficulties right now. So could you read the next question? Yeah, the next one is, is about a Craigslist fraud, Craigslist fraud, and um, uh, we have seen this uh, before. This is not typically a cyber attack. This is more kind of just a standard uh, fraud, white collar type attack where, again, someone wants to send you a cashier's check and then you pay the difference and someone comes up and picks up the product. And um, the uh, check that you have there is probably worthless at this point. Um, you could uh, you could turn that check into a bank uh, and say that you believe it's fraudulent. Uh, the bank uh, will um, be able to kind of handle that check and then either report it to the financial institution that issued it. But uh, we see this whole cashier's check scam being utilized a lot on Craigslist. We also see it on eBay. Someone will offer to pay uh, hundreds of dollars more for whatever item you're selling but they'll say that they'll send you a, a cashier's check and then you just keep uh, half the amount or whatever it is. Uh, typically these uh, actors are uh, trying to launder money and that's typically how that works or they're using uh, inform uh, uh, financial information from a stolen account. Um, my advice is if you're selling something on Craigslist and or eBay, um, just go with the standard payment scheme. Don't accept uh, cashier's checks. Don't uh, be, be naturally suspicious about people who are saying, I want them, I live overseas, but I'm going to have some, a representative show up to, to pick it up. Um, that, that's usually indicative of some fraudulent activity. Let's see what other types of questions we have here. For individuals and families, would a VPN put an effective barrier in front of hackers? VPN is, is a great technique. It's a virtual private network that allows you to establish um, a, a, an encrypted tunnel between your uh, device and whatever network you're talking to. Again, VPNs are, are only as good as the password that you assign to it. So if you have a, uh, a not very sophisticated password um, and you get spearfished, then they're going to probably, those actors are going to probably be able to, uh, to pop that. Uh, we recommend uh, using uh, VPNs uh, if you're in a business situation and you're talking to your uh, company. Um, because again, that traffic as it's transmitted over the internet is done using encrypted packets, which can't be, uh, you know, uh, sniffed out or monitored by malicious actors. So VPNs are great. Um, and, and they're always a good thing to utilize, especially if you are concerned with privacy. Um, okay, I'm, I'm back. Password managed. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Great. Great. Uh, so, uh, um, I was going to be the next question here, which is, which is a password manager question. That is, um, that's a great uh, suggestion. Uh, I use a password manager. Um, there are many to choose from and they all typically are on par with each other. For those who are not familiar with a password manager, 
that's a um, sort of a subscription service that you work with a company that uh, you create one single uh, really good password that you can remember. And when you um, use that password with that service, you then are able then to generate these very complex passwords for all your other accounts. And the password manager manages all of those passwords for you. So you really just have to remember one good password, uh, which is the key to that password vault. And um, it is a great way of managing and making sure that each one of the passwords that you have for all the different accounts that you have, email, bank, social media, you name it, each one of those passwords is different and complex uh, and hard to crack. Susan, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks. Um, I was going to say, I, I actually use LastPass and it, it's wonderful because I don't have to remember everything. I just need that one password. Um, the next question we have, um, the, they ask, given the number of bad actor cyber attack methods and seeming ease of access to corporate info, what can we as individuals do to protect our, in, our information? You seem vulnerable to any intentional attempt to get us. Are individuals at significant risk or just organizations? Uh, good question. Sadly, the, uh, the state of affairs is that everybody is at risk. And, and the reason everyone is at risk is that there's so much collected data on all of us uh, as customers, as um, you know, people who pay taxes, people who have mortgages, people who have purchased uh, cars. Uh, an enormous amount of PII is collected just as a, as a normal aspect of, of doing business. And that information is collected and aggregated by uh, these companies, the credit bureaus, the mortgage companies, uh, credit cards, banks, things like that. And again, time and time and again, we've seen the people that hold this data fall victim to massive data breaches. And so uh, sadly, you know, the, um, the information on all of us is, is typically out there. Um, and the way you can protect yourself again is to look at ways to hamper or hinder uh, someone automatically being able to utilize your data, right? Again, most people I've, I've spoken to haven't put a lock on their credit uh, report. All you have to do is put a lock on one of the three credit bureaus and the other two are essentially locked as well. Uh, I've tested this out where if uh, someone, I was doing a purchase for a refi for a mortgage, I forgot to turn the lock off. Um, they'll do the credit check and they'll say, oh, there's a credit lock. We can't do the credit check. Can you contact the company, the credit bureau and unlock it? Um, then you have control of that. You unlock it, they do their check, then you relock it and then uh, they're not able to, um, to actually uh, uh, utilize your, your the information in your credit card. I know Mr. Ellis has asked the question, what is PII? Personally identifiable information. So name, DOB, social security number, the last three places that you lived, um, your car registration, uh, your credit card information. That's valuable data um, that criminals can uh, utilize and uh, take advantage of. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question, does using biometrics to access your account um, make it a safer option? And what are the risks of doing that? Uh, so biometrics for folks who don't know is just using something that you are, for example, your iris, uh, your retinal pattern, your fingerprints on you know, some computers have, laptops have fingerprint readers. Um, that typically is uh, a very, very secure way of authenticating but uh, if those of you with uh, early iPhones, there was a way of using your thumb to unlock the iPhone. Uh, now it just uses your face. Uh, so biometrics are just one way that you can enable, uh, you know, really secure authentication, but it shouldn't be the only way that you uh, um, access something. It should be in combination with something you are, your face, your fingerprints, your retinal uh, pattern, and something that you know, like a pin or a password, uh, and then something maybe that you have, like a token on your phone that's assigned to you. So biometrics is just one of the things, one of the, one of the legs of the tripod you can uh, envision in trying to protect uh, your access and being able to authenticate. Okay. Um, 
And Mr. Ellis had another question going back to your previous answer. How do you do a credit bureau lock? So all you have to do is just go to any one of the three major credit bureaus. You can just literally Google it. And you, believe me, you have an account at all three credit bureaus uh, if you're over 18 um, and establish any kind of credit. Um, each credit bureau does it a little bit differently. Some try to charge you, although the credit bureaus, especially Equifax, have taken a lot of heat because they suffered a, a massive uh, breach uh, a couple of years ago. So you can, there are more than one way to do it for free. Um, and all you have to do is just Google it. And then you just authenticate with that um, credit bureau. So typically it's going to ask for things that only you would know, like addresses or um, places you've lived at or phone numbers you've used or um, the name of your spouse and things like that. Once you authenticate with that credit bureau, you can then say, I want to put a credit lock. Uh, you should be able to do it for free. Sometimes they'll try to upsell you a subscription service. Um, I, I find that's not as valuable. But once you can put a credit lock in, basically that means uh, anyone that tries to do a like, credit check on you will receive a notice that it's locked and they will not get any information. The default has been for years uh, not to have a credit lock. I mean, anytime you apply for a loan, they would just do that credit check. The credit bureaus would respond and then they would, just, they would make that decision about whether or not uh, to lend you money. But putting that lock on there is just another way of assuming that the bad guys have information about you make it harder for them to utilize it. Um, here, here's a question. Has the FBI partnered with hackers? And if so, what would the nature of that partnership be? I'm sorry, could you, could, I don't see that in the chat. Can you, can you repeat that um, first part? It, um, he, he's asking a, that he has heard about the FBI partnering with all kinds of hackers. Oh, okay. And he mentions Las Vegas and he says, what would the nature of that partnership be? So we don't really have partnerships per se with hackers, but one thing that we do um, all the time is talk to hackers. Um, some hackers don't want to talk to the FBI. Um, Las Vegas, you're referring to uh, a yearly, um, two, two um, really, really popular cybersecurity conferences uh, that are held almost uh, right after each other, typically in August. Uh, the first is Black Hat and the other is DEF CON. And the um, FBI goes to both conferences. We, we um, sometimes even have a booth there where we try to do the outreach mission that I'm doing today, where we just try to talk and make contact and establish uh, lines of communication. But typically, um, I think, Hackers are, are, are largely misunderstood. When, uh, I think I know hackers are annoyed that the term is pejorative these days, but initially it wasn't a pejorative term. It was described somebody who tinkers, who tries to figure out how a system works and tries to identify ways to break it. Because again, if you can break something, that means it, it's not functioning the way that it should. So um, we talk to hackers and um, I know some hackers and I think they're really cool, interesting people. Um, but like, you know, like the whole bell curve of humanity, some people are good, some people are bad. Hackers kind of fall in that same, uh, that same bell curve. So there, there are white hat hackers that are truly looking for ways to make things improve. Gray hat hackers who kind of are in between. Uh, and then of course the black hat guys, which uh, are out there to create mayhem or steal uh, information. Um, so the, the last two questions are more technical. Uh, mm -hmm. Someone asked, if you share a device with a spouse, can you still use biometrics? Um, that's going to depend on the device. That that's going to that's gonna depend on the device. So for an iPhone, you can register a face. Um, sometimes you might be able to register one or more faces. Um, as a cybersecurity uh, researcher, I would say I would, I would not share a digital device. Um, the reasons for doing that is that so much of our access to other accounts and our access to things that are important to us, uh, whether it be social media accounts or financial accounts or mortgages, things like that, are really now tied to these digital devices. I mean, it's ironic that a phone, uh, the, the least used app on a phone is the phone, right? Like we're actually carrying these devices around as many computers that allow us to do really, really interesting things and, and but with that comes some measure of risk. So if you're able to not share a device like that, 
try to have your own device. And, and the reason is that, again, if you have two identities on one device and that device gets popped, both those identities are now compromised. If you have one device and one identity and that phone gets popped, it's just one identity, right? So the idea there is try to get your own device. Um, and the last question, many accounts ask specific PI that personal information that you would only know. Are there any laws against companies asking PI data to open accounts? There are no laws uh, restricting what a company can ask you to do. And um, some people complain that the FBI knows a lot about people. You would be shocked to know how much your credit card company knows about you to include uh, where you physically go to shop. Because again, if you present your card at a vendor, it will record that location. It will record the frequency in which you pay, the things that you buy. Uh, you, with that data, you can make inferences about how wealthy you are or how, uh, how poor you are, uh, what sort of things you like to buy. All of that data by using that credit card is under consent with that bank. So these banks and these financial institutions know a lot more about you than say the government, right? I always kind of chuckle when people talk about the government's fine on me. No, no, your, your bank's fine on you. They know a lot more, but uh, there's no, there's nothing illegal about asking for personally identifiable information to help secure your account. Um, I've talked to a number of people, hackers included, who say that um, you're not under any obligation to tell the truth about that sort of thing. And, and given how much of our personal information has already been compromised in previous breaches, maybe you shouldn't be using your mom's real maiden name. Make up a different name, right? So that when your PII is, is reviewed by a criminal, they're going to know that your mother's maiden name is, say, Smith. Well, just say it's Jones instead, because then you know what you've said to that company, but the hacker doesn't, right? If the hacker gets a hold of your information, they'll say, oh, I've got all the information that, you know, I know who this person's sister and brother are. I know their parents' name, where they were born. Uh, I'll bet you that I can hack their account by using those questions to authenticate. And if you've made up information, then all that information is useless to them. Again, try to stay one step ahead of some of these uh, malicious actors. Well, uh, just one second, because I, See that there are <laughs> more more questions for Mr. Ellis. <laughs> um, Let me so answer the first one, the Facebook and Google yeah. question. There, yeah, is our PII invasion from Facebook and Google? Um, social media um, companies uh, make a fortune off of us, right? And so, but you don't pay to use Facebook. You don't pay to use Google. Um, you don't pay to use uh, Outlook or Yahoo Mail or what have you. Uh, anytime you're using a free service like that, you are the product. You are the actual thing that's being commoditized, right? And so by using these free uh, services, you're giving up to them, either knowingly or unknowingly, wittingly or unwittingly, an enormous amount of information about yourself, which then that company uses to market and, and sell advertisements that are specific to you. You might wonder why you're starting to see advertisements that are, I was thinking about buying a bike and then you did a search for a bike and then all of a sudden you're getting ads for a, a specific type of bike, maybe a very specific type of, of, of bike that you were interested in. That's because again, these companies are recording uh, all of the activity that you have. You're not paying to use Google, but you are the product that Google is productizing. So it's not there's nothing wrong with it. You just have to understand that's the contract that you're, that you're making. Have any of us ever read all of the terms of services on any of these companies? You'd be surprised some of the things that you're giving up when you use them. So, Do you want to take that last question? If uh, do is... Facebook glasses break the law? No, um, they don't uh, because it's not illegal to have, walk around with a camera. And that's essentially what you know, <laughs> what, those, uh, what those glasses would be like. Um, if you are out on the street, you have no reasonable expectation of privacy. That's why companies can have cameras on the outside of their uh, businesses. And as you walk by, uh, you're on camera. Um, I think the, the, the idea of Google Glass or Facebook Glasses uh, are, are going to challenge what it means to be, uh, to have, to be under surveillance or to be under the ability to have somebody record what your actions um, are. I think that just we're going to need to either update social norms about what that means and be able to identify if you're wearing a pair of glasses that 
essentially we'll have a camera. Some articles that I'm reading are saying that that will be commonplace in the next 10 years and that we will just essentially accept it as, as a society um, because, you know, people 40 years ago would not understand some of the technology that we have that we take for granted today. So um, the actual idea there is that uh, I think it's going to be an iterative process and we will have to sort of understand norms, behavioral norms about how technology will get a little bit more invasive every year. I mean, who would have thought we would carry devices around that can record in high definition, that record the location of a video with high degree of accuracy. Uh, a lot of that is just kind of science fiction about 10, 15 years ago. Um, and the idea of glasses with uh, cameras in them is, is, along, is along the same way. Well, um, uh, we are going to bring this program to a close. So I just wanna thank you, Enrique, for taking time out of your busy schedule. Um, and thank you for all you do to keep us safe. Um, and I wanna thank everybody who joined us tonight. Um, all of those who register for this event will receive a link to the recorded video and you will get um, copies of the slides that were presented. If you enjoyed tonight's program and look forward to more, we invite you to uh, return next Thursday for the second Finance 102 program Trust and Estate Planning in Today's Environment with Walnut Creek Attorney Joan Grimes. And um, please consider making a gift to support these programs. Your gift makes a difference. And um, you can visit us on our website or um, donate from the link in the chat box. So I just want to thank everybody again for attending and have a good night. Thanks, everyone. Be safe.